seminario. Les agradecemos su atención y estar aquí presentes para el tema que vamos a tratar a continuación. De hecho, es importante que mantengamos siempre el silencio y la atención a nuestros panelistas en todos los eventos que tendremos en este salón. Bueno, pues iniciemos de inmediato y esta vez hablamos del tema Transformando el Futuro, Acelerar la Transición Energética en América Latina y el Caribe. Si bien es cierto que hemos tenido muchos avances en América Latina y en el Caribe con relación a las energías renovables, algunos de estos temas con relación al panorama no han sido tan favorables. Hoy vamos a ver diferentes aristas y perspectivas con relación a este tema para ver cómo nos arrojan mucha luz. Para eso quiero recibir en este escenario a nuestros panelistas y a nuestra moderadora Alejandra Bernal Guzmán, oficial de programa para América Latina de la Agencia Internacional de Energía. Fuerte el aplauso para ellos. Buenas tardes. Para mí es un gusto Good estar afternoon. acá con ustedes It's para presentar to be with you, to present the main findings of the Latin America Energy Outlook, a report we prepared at the International Energy Agency in 2023 in close cooperation with the IDB and also with the countries in the region. Today I will talk about the general outlook for the region and also about the outlook and trends going forward, which will change according to the situations and political decisions. Let's hope this information will also provide food for thought for the discussion among our panelists after this presentation. I would first like to talk about how Latin America is positioned as part of the energy transition and in terms of the uh, some of the main energy indicators. We can clearly see that Latin America is um, undisputably a leader in generating electricity by using renewable sources. We have 60% penetration of renewable sources in the region, which is twice the world average, which is only 30%. And clearly, this is driven by hydropower, which for years has been the pillar of the electricity sector in Latin America. Likewise, we see Latin America leading in the use of biofuel for transport, Brazil playing a key role in this regard. And again, the use of biofuel is twice the world average. On this, it is important to recall that electricity is not the same as energy. And despite the prominent leadership of Latin America in generating clean electricity, there remains a significant challenge in terms of reliance on fossil fuels. Although our average share in the mix is lower than the world average, in Latin America we have about 70% as opposed to 80% worldwide, but still this is very high reliance because the fuel is also used for transport, for sea, land and air transport, as well as for industry. Here we'll look at two indicators for fossil fuels, gas, uh, it's in the report, on coal, we can see a very small share, which affords Latin America an advantage to decarbonize its industries. We have only 5% as opposed to 25% worldwide. In some cases, this is used for generation and for industry. But on oil, we see greater reliance, 40% penetration of petroleum in the energy mix of the region, which is 10% higher than for the rest of the world, which is very important in order to understand what challenge we are facing. 
That said, what will be the conditions for Latin America to move forward as part of the energy transition? What's the platform? The vast resources, renewable resources, Latin America has offer a platform to advance rapidly in the energy transition. And I don't mean just water resources, which we know are very vast and we have made good use of them, nor do I mean traditional energy sources. It's clear that Latin America has a significant role in oil and gas production, over 15% of the world's resources, but there's also wind and solar, which offer great potential for use in the region. All you can see on the map in the blue and uh, you will see on the chart the uh, potential for uh, solar and wind, which will not only be important for electricity generation, but this is also an enabler for the region to produce low emission hydrogen and for it to also start working on its clean manufacturing chains. Let's not forget about the great potential the region offers for production and even processing of critical minerals for the energy transition the minerals without which it's impossible to conceive of a transition. Lithium for batteries or copper for transmission lines, rare earths, and Latin America is already strongly positioned in this field, but can, uh, can advance even more by sustainably using these resources. Now then, you'll see on the next slides, not what's going on now, but what could happen in the future based on certain assumptions. At the International Energy Agency, we use three main scenarios that you will see on the next couple of slides. The first one is a business as usual scenario. What would happen if we were to continue using the current policies and the ones that have been announced? The second, more ambitious scenario is what would happen if countries were to really meet their climate commitments, the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the NDCs. And one last more ambitious scenario is the net zero, which assumes that all countries in the world achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. So let's start with oil, the only source of uh, fuel I will show today as it is the one for which the region has the greatest share. We can see that if things stay as they are, in the business as usual case, there won't be a major decrease in oil consumption. It will be a slight reduction. But in the most ambitious scenario, which is what we need, if uh, we can achieve a 10% reduction by 2030 in oil consumption, that will have a major impact on emissions in the region in terms of the energy sector. Just a note of clarification. When you look at the reduction in oil consumption, that doesn't necessarily entail a reduction in oil production in the region. Our studies show that Guyana and Brazil will be two of the countries with the highest increase in oil production by 2030. And with that, I'd like to note that at the agency, we always stress that new investments in the oil sector need to take into account the commercial risk involved, because most countries are seeking to reduce consumption. Let's now see what will happen in the electric energy sector in the ambitious scenario meeting the climate goals. Latin America, again, uh, confirms its leadership in the generation of clean electricity by 2030. The mix of uh, Latin America, which is clean already today with 60% clean energy, becomes even cleaner, 66%. And only by 2030 do advanced economies get to the point where Latin America is. We also see a significant gap relative to the global average and relative to the average in emerging economies where the uh, major countries in Asia and Africa are. On the right-hand side, we can see what the structure of the energy mix would be by 2030. And here, I would like to say again that this very clean energy mix 
offers the region a platform to continue to move forward with the energy transition. When you look at the per country breakdown, it's interesting to look at the high diversity in electricity mixes in the region. Although we often talk about Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole, but each country and region obviously has different challenges to face. And I would like to stress a takeaway from the report. This is something that the IDB has worked a lot on. It's the importance of regional electric interconnectivity. And some progress has been made, but we need even swifter progress because it's only through electric interconnection that we'll be able to harness the potential of complementarity across systems. And that way we'll have a more climate resilience electric system. As I already mentioned, what I presented a few moments ago is not what will happen. This is what would happen if we were to really fulfill our climate ambitions. For this, we need some enabling factors. And one of the key factors is certainly investments. And I would like to shed light on some data on Latin America and in emerging economies, it's the same too. So even though there has been 40% growth in the last uh, few years, only 15% of the increase is going to emerging economies. The rest is flowing to advanced economies and to China, which creates a major need to focus on this. What Latin America needs is more and better investments and enabling frameworks in order for the investments to be successful. On the first graph, I would like to highlight the way investments are redistributed. And you can see how some go from oil and gas in dark green to the electricity sector and end use like industry and transport. So there will be a shift with the investments flowing by 2030 and 2050 from the traditional sectors to clean technologies. And if we zoom in on the electricity sector, you will see that at the 2022 baseline, investments were around $50 billion a year, a little more than that. And an increase in investments will be needed by 2030, but 2030 is around the corner. So it should be $75 billion approximately. But the big leap, you know, investments need to really increase by 2050. We can see that investments must increase by 2.5 by 2050 in the electricity sector. And within that sector, investment in renewables should grow by 70, or reach 70%. And let me note that in terms of distribution and transmission, we'll need a sevenfold increase in the investments. Wrapping up this presentation, I would like to leave a few messages on what we see as the major opportunities in this report with uh, energy transition Latin America at the center. What are two of the major challenges for implementation of the transition? First, a rapid uh, transition with uh, fulfillment of the climate goals by 2030 will help us advance on a people-centered, um, inclusive, and just transition that will close gaps. 10 million people could gain access to electricity. Let's recall that Latin America still has a gap involving 17 million people with no access to electricity. And in a business-as-usual scenario, by 2030, only 1 million more people would have access to electricity. This is why it's important to understand why we need to move faster, become more ambitious, and also match our rhetoric to practice. Our rhetoric at the COP climate announcement really needs to match what governments are doing and putting in place. Secondly, we also see a very significant reduction in deaths that could be avoided deaths related to contamination within households due to the fact that uh, people don't have access to clean cooking 
methods. 75 million people in Latin America don't have clean cooking solutions at home, and 80,000 people die every year. By 2030, we could avoid 30,000 of those deaths. And going back to employment and uh, economic revitalization, this would be leveraged by the energy transition. And we estimate a million new jobs could be created in the formal market in the uh, accelerated transition scenario by 2030, which would create a unique opportunity for Latin America to continue to position itself against the backdrop of the global energy transition. We calculate that biofuel transition could increase by 2.5 times while opening up to new markets. Hydrogen is something the report looks at in depth, and we think that a million tons of hydrogen could be produced by 2030, low emissions hydrogen, which could not just meet the local demand for hydrogen, but also go to exports on critical minerals, uh, use sustainably and responsibly for the energy transition. We think there's f some 50 billion additional dollars in income that the region could have. So this could be a great window for additional revenue and also to make up for income that would be lost in the uh, gas industry and oil and gas. And I think two of the other main challenges have to do with um, investments in clean energies in general that require doubling investments by 2030. And finally, on energy efficiency, this is something that is often forgotten. The region is lagging behind quite a bit in terms of energy efficiency when it comes to improving the energy intensity in the region. We calculate that one out of three countries have measures to ensure that there's uh, more efficient appliances and equipment at home or better engines in buildings as well. This is a big challenge that Latin America needs to deal with. And we think if we were to make progress, we would achieve a 20% reduction in consumption by 2030 only through energy efficiency measures in buildings, transport, and industries. Please take a look at the report for Latin America, uh, which is available free of charge on our website. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alejandra Bernal Guzman from the International Energy Agency. And it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, we have a fantastic panel with us. I'll introduce them in one minute. Um, but first, I'd just like to offer a few uh, introductory uh, comments, if I may, from the perspective of the Inter-American Development Bank. I think the first question that I would ask myself to address in order to frame this discussion is why would a multilateral institution care so much about the topic of, the, of energy transition? We heard President Goldfein discuss this importance this morning. Um, it sits at the nexus of many of our priorities. Specifically, we care about how the transition, how an energy transition could reduce the cost of power for consumers, particularly for the poor. Now that renewable energy um, is below the average tariff cost in many of the countries of our region. We care about the 70 million people in the region who still do not have access to electricity, and we believe that there's potential for off-grid renewables to help close the gap, the access gap. We care about the health impacts, as Alejandra was mentioning. She was describing the, the, the deaths, unnecessary deaths and preliminary deaths in the region. We care about the health impacts from local particulates, from the pollutants, from the combustion of fossil fuels, particularly from industry and from automobiles. We care about the impacts on balance of payments for fossil fuel importing countries and the, and the, the currency mismatch that's caused by the expenditures on, on fossil fuels. And of course, we care about climate impacts. Even if our region's contribution to emissions is about equivalent to its share of the world's population, seven to 8%, we are seeking the sustainability that comes with the energy transit transmission. So I mentioned that energy transition sits at the nexus 
of the human, economic, financial, and environmental priorities of the Inter-American Development Bank, and more importantly, of the countries that depend on our support, requires policies, regulations, consumer and popular consensus and understanding, technology, and lots of investment, much of it long-term and at as low cost as possible. That spells multilateral development bank intervention. It spells the Inter-American Development Bank. So my main takeaways from the IEA report, from Alejandro's presentation, and, and wonderful summary of that rich piece of analysis, and of the IDB's own approach to supporting the energy transition is the following, if I can be didactic and try to simplify. The LAC region has a green power matrix, referring to electricity, that is extremely already green um, and sustainable, and it can be leveraged in the, in the years ahead. The LAC region is still dependent on fossil fuels across the energy matrix writ large. So we, we're not only looking at power, we, when we also think about tra transport and industry and the industrial uses of, uh, of, of energy, we are still um, largely dependent, upwards of 70% dependent on fossil fuels. That there are several challenges ahead of us from pricing and regulation to investment and greater inclusion of the private sector and the transfer of technology and the solutions that we're seeking. Our estimates, if I remember correctly, the front row can nod right or wrong if I get the numbers wrong, but that we are seeing about $38 billion a year in investment right now in the power sector at least, and that we expect that that would need to go to about $50 billion uh, per year across the region. Sorry, 38, yeah, $38 billion to $50 billion per year. Um, that's more than doubling. Uh, the level of investment in renewable energy, as Alejandra mentioned, and considerable investment overall in, in the power sector. That investment could shift the whole matrix. This is another ten, uh, takeaway, not just for power, but toward greener energy use in industry and transport as well. The approach differs by country, it differs by technology, it differs by subsector, but we are on the threshold of that change and we need to be prepared and we need to move quickly now. Um, I'd like to introduce to you the panel, if I may, uh, Silvia Alvarado de Cordoba, the former head of the energy regulator of Guatemala and the current president of the board of directors, administradora del, del mercado mayorista de Guatemala, Marsha Atherley Ikechi, chief executive office of the, of the Fair Trading Commission of Barbados. That's includes the energy regulator and basically serves as the antitrust function of all, uh, of all industries in Barbados. Gabriel Meguizo Posada, the president of ISA. Aurelio Bustillo de Oliveira, excuse my terrible Portuguese pronunciation, <laughs> the CEO of Enel Americas. This panel represents a market operator, a regulator and competition authority, major network industry investor, and a green energy investor that covers all sides of the energy matrix. Uh, this panel is fit for purpose to explain what is being done, what the challenges are. And as Sylvia said yesterday to me, we need to focus first and foremost, given the amount of time that we have, on what the benefits are, no, to this energy transition. So that is what we will focus on. Y las reglas del juego, básicamente la gente puede hablar en el idioma que, se, que prefiera. Eh, yo voy a intentar a preguntar las preguntas, disculpa a todo el mundo para mi castellano, pero voy a intentar a preguntar las preguntas a, a Silvia. I'm going to ask, you can choose the language of your preference. I'm going to ask the questions of Silvia, Aurelio, and Gabriel in Spanish, and uh, of Marsha in English, if that's okay. That way we can interact in Spanish and English. I'll start with Silvia, please. Thank you. And for some context, let me say that Guatemala is a particularly important case for the IDB when we look at the region as a whole. Because of course, Guatemala is not Brazil, it's not a large market, it's not Canada in terms of average household income in the country. We are talking about a country with some 17 million people and uh, five or six thousand dollars average income. But 
it has had a wholesale market, a market functioning for 27 years with stability, prices uh, gradually coming down, if I understood correctly, Guatemala has achieved significant progress as part of its transition within that uh, functioning market. And uh, the energy mix has been sustainable. It's reduced its reliance on fossil fuels. And it's moved to um, from 50 to 22 percent uh, nowadays. And uh, how, how did you manage to make this change in your electricity mix? And what role did the market play to help along this process? Thank you very much. Just very quickly, let me thank you for the opportunity to be with all of you sharing a success story in a country which has so many problems and challenges to do with. And yet, the electricity market has been highly developed and sustainable over the past three decades. The sector was reformed in 1996 by putting in place a regulatory framework which clearly uh, fostered public participation. And in order to instill life into the regulatory framework, the government sold off its majority shareholding in the three distribution companies that uh, controlled the service or dominated the service in the country. And this led to a tender process for both generation and transmission. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to say that we went from an exhausted, depleted electricity model in the 90s to a market that has attracted a non-negligible figure for a country like Guatemala, which is over $10 billion in the different activities. So how were we able to put this in place and consolidate it? The regulatory framework provides that the Ministry of Energy and Mines, which is the one in charge of the policies, sets the uh, guidelines for the use or, and best use of our resources. And this is embedded in long-term uh, bidding processes coordinated by the regulator, and this in turn applies to the operators, private capital nowadays. And the system has proved to be highly successful in order to diversify our energy matrix with no uh, need for cross subsidies or special rates or tariffs. This was simply by affording legal certainty to investors, and this has been a truly very powerful engine for our tender processes to be considerably successful and for them to attract a lot of capital. So today, the market already has plenty of electric generation, solar and wind energy projects, in addition to some geothermal installed and a very vast biomass um, resource, which helps us in summer when hydropower doesn't have that much uh, flow. So we produce a lot of energy through biomass. What benefits has this brought for consumers? First of all, a reduction, a very significant reduction in tariffs, because we went from having the highest tariffs in Central America to having a reduction by up to 50% in the rates for the distributors in the central area. And we've also been able to achieve a reduction in technical and non-technical losses in distribution, which is quite positive for a country like ours. The central distributor has less than 6% by way of total losses, and the rural distributors have tops 15% they can pass through to the tariffs. We had started with 30% distribution losses some years ago. Also, I should quickly mention that opening up the market has made it possible to supply unregulated demand at very competitive prices. More than 1,300 major users representing commercial and industrial entities are supplied directly from generators, and 43 generators currently operate on the market. If you look at the size of Guatemala's market, these figures are 
true indicators of the fact that our market is very competitive. It's been quite stable. Now, legal certainty, as I mentioned, was important for the auctions. Right now, distribution companies buy all of their energy through electronic bidding processes. So prices have been coming down. We began with a total combined process of purchase of $117 megawatt hour. And in the last bidding process, the purchase price was $79 megawatt hour, but we even reached historic prices of $20 per megawatt hour. Also, we had some offers of combined technology. So where do we stand now in the market? We have proposed to the regulator regulations so as to be able to support investing in storage because the long-term goal is for us to have 80% renewable energy in our energy matrix. And fortunately for us, in 2023, the demand was supplied with more than 70% renewable energy as a sole source. Now, I should also say that for our country, there are still major challenges ahead, of course, universalizing the service Delivering electrical power is still a goal that we have to achieve. But before we did the reform, Guatemala only had 40% coverage, and that was increased to 90% thanks to expanding the network. And I should say that this was thanks to the support of the Inter-American Development Bank. Working side by side with the government, they financed a trust for rural electrification. And lastly, I would like to tell you how important international interconnections are. Guatemala is interconnected with Mexico and with other countries of Central America, thanks to a project called the CIAPAC Line. CIAPAC has been a complete success, and it was supported by the Inter-American Development Bank. It promoted that line. It's now a reality. We are connected from Guatemala to Panama, and Guatemala is connected bilaterally with Mexico. These interconnections allow for supply at critical junctures so that we can exchange surpluses from one country to another, and also to improve prices. We began to be a net exporter in the regional market, and now we benefit from being an importer. So generally speaking, this has been a complete success. Thank you. Thank you. And if we have more time, we could go back to the interconnection and also the trade in energy to see if we can get into further details. I'm going to jump to Marsha, if that's okay, um, because we, were, we talked about Guatemala being a, a relatively small market. But Barbados works on a whole different level of scale economies. Um, and still, Barbados has pledged to reach 100% renewable energy by 2030. It has different levels of challenges to get there and has used different tools in order to get there. Um, solar power accounts for almost 11% of the, of the generation electricity already, which is, con which is considerable in a country with a system that is basically serving 350, 400,000 people. Um, the country is also leading the Caribbean in the development of e-mobility as a small economy. Um, could you give us a sense of what you see as the, the present hurdles to meet the commitments that Bar Barbados has set? Um, and maybe talk to us a little, about, a little bit about particular struggles of an island in making these commitments, um, and whether this you see as something that is relevant lessons for the Caribbean at large. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank to ID, IDB for the opportunity. I'm not sure if you're hearing me well. Mm -mm. Maybe Seems we could effect. ask the audio to turn up Marsha's yeah. microphone a little bit. One more try. So I want to first set the context because we spoke of Guatemala and Guatemala being a very small market. But within the context of Guatemala, Barbados is probably even <laughs> less than micro. Um, with our revised IRRP, the expected um, install capacity is around 523 megawatts of generation. 
There's also an expectation that um, storage capacity will be, will be in the order of 465 megawatts um, with the expectation in terms of demand from the transportation sector to be around 264 gigawatt hours. So that's set in the context in the first instance. So this is relatively small in the scheme of things. However, we have made significant strides in terms of bringing our renewables. We started this, this process, our journey, um, in 2010 with a renewable energy rider. Since then, we've moved on to transform for, from an, um, what should I say, from a, a state where we're looking at avoided costs to resource-based costing. And we've had four iterations of tariffs with such. Um, beyond that, we are to the point where we have in excess of 3,000 distributed generators on the system. The utility also has a 10 megawatt facility, um, solar PV facility, and a five megawatt um, storage facility. But we are also to the point where there's recognition that the level of penetration as it stands now, which is roughly 102 megawatts, ha is beginning to cause some challenges in terms of grid stability. How do we address that issue? And, be and that's even more so important because we are dealing with variable sources of renewables that we have employed thus far. That means that we have to look at storage. We have to also look at expanding or uh, modernizing our grid. We need to have sigmas condensers on the system. We need to be able um, to have automated controls as well. So those things require significant investment um, on the part of the utility, but then there's also scope for private investment, particularly as it relates to storage. And that is where uh, the challenge is. We are to the point where we've had to um, temporarily halt um, the provision of licenses, new licenses for renewable energy because we, we anticipate further instability. And in order to mitigate that, we've determined that we will temporarily halt uh, new licenses so as to allow the grid to come up to speed and for us to be able to procure the storage that is necessary. We are not intending to procure the storage in one go, but over a period of time. In terms of the regulatory component of that, what we have determined is that we will provide a facility to be able to fast track any applications relative to the energy transition. So those things are in play, and we actually have an application before the, before the commission in that regard. Um, beyond the whole idea of investment in the grid, you want to be able to allow for investment at a competitive rate. Competitive in the sense, in, in the scope of a large entity, is very, very different from a small island that, is, that has an undiversified economy. The reality is that our systems, our economic systems, are unable to carry any more strain, particularly coming out of the pandemic. So what we're asking for, and I'm sure you've heard my prime minister ask for, is concessional financing. That is an absolute. Not only in terms of, of the cost of capital, but we want to have it over a longer period so as to allow us to give us that fiscal space. I mean, so. At this point, we are being asked to operate um, like, I would say, um, alpha predators as um, like a blue whale, when we are in fact are the single cell organisms in this playing field. The scale not comparable at all. And we are asking that we be treated relative to what our particular circumstances are. That's the only fair and proper thing to do. So we cannot be uh, boxed in with Latin America because we really do not have those economies of scale. We don't have those financial tools. At this point, we are now beginning to, to establish green bonds. But even with those green bonds, they're at the level where the large enterprises can utilize those. What we have determined, what the government of Barbados has determined is that they want to democratize that space. 
and in democratizing the space, the intention is to allow every single household in Barbados the right to be able to participate in the energy landscape. And in doing so, my government has committed um, to allowing every single household to have a minimum of 10 kilowatts of energy uh, of, of uh, capacity on the rooftops. So there are a number of other, uh, uh, other initiatives in relation to that. Say, for example, you spoke of, of EV. <coughs> um, in that space, there are incentives, particularly for civil servants, to be able to get um, electric vehicles at a no interest rate. So the government is essentially financing up to $100,000 with um, no interest. Um, with that, though, there are also some concerns because at this point, we have in excess of 2,500 EVs on the road. And this is apart from the public transportation fleet, which has been converted, 80% converted to electric vehicles. That then has a demand on the system. How do we manage that demand, knowing where we're at now in terms of grid stability? That has to, to be taken into account. Uh, what we have not done is to look at time of use rates to incentivize drivers to be able to charge during off peak times. Off -peak times. That is something that we definitely need to look at. So those are some of the things that we're, we're, we're looking at, but there's a whole lot more to be done. And one of the things I want, really want to stress is that we simply cannot afford to be lumped in with the larger entities that have the financial wherewithal. We must be able um, and you must understand that we need to be treated um, separate and distinct. We don't have the economies of scale. Um, there's the CARICOM. Um, we've tried that collective bargaining with the vaccines. That has proven to be successful. Perhaps we can come together as a region to offer similar things. But the reality here is, though, the paradox here is, is that we are all at different levels of development when it comes to renewables. We all use, we, we use different technologies. As in Kits of Dominica, they are largely driven by um, geothermal. So, you know, Barbados does not have that. Those are the dynamics that we have to work with. Right. Yeah. Marcia, thank you so much for that tour through Barbados's <laughs> energy an emerging energy sector. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you for the regulator's view on the incentives, the investments. We'll come back around and maybe do a little bit of summary if we, uh, yes. if we have a, a, a bit of time. I think I'd like to turn to Isa, if I can. Um, I had a couple of questions for you, but pero puede ser que usamos la conversación que ya estamos teniendo, eh, Gabriel. Could we talk about Gabriel? Gabriel is vice president of transmission of energy in ESA. And ESA, the ESA group in Colombia, has an important presence in the electric transmission sector of all of Latin America, in Argentina, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and in Central America. Yes, thank you. So. It's about 50,000 kilometers of transmission, right? Now, from what I understand, expanding these grids faces obstacles, delays in planning, execution of projects, perhaps social acceptance, the complexity associated with getting the necessary permits, for example. And at the same time, you say that without transmission, there is no transition. So what should we do to accelerate the development of the necessary transmission infrastructure to decarbonize electric grids and to accomplish climate objectives in a timely fashion. And could you explain? Could you explain why transmission is so important for the energy transition? So as to give all of us a context so we can understand the importance of that issue. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, 
I'm hard of hearing, so it's hard for me to hear myself. First of all, I want to thank the IDB for the invitation, and I thank the people here in Dominican Republic for their warm hospitality. It is incredible how well we have been treated. I am here with my wife, and everyone has been very kind. So thank you to Dominican Republic. The truth is, when you talk about energy transition. Usually they're talking about generating energy. And it's not that I am going to try to criticize what you do, quite the contrary. But the transition hasn't been fair. When you talk about energy transmission, energy transition, you have to talk about transmission too. Why? Because that can often be the limiting factor. Because electrons, the world is focusing on producing clean electrons, but those electrons have to flow, flow across transmission lines, through voltage, through distribution, at uh, low and high voltages, etc. So electrons have to reach users. There's no other way. It has to go through the grid. So transmission in the grid is high voltage. So that is the major highways crossing Latin America. That is the road over which electrons travel. So any electron, clean or dirty, if it is transmitted across Latin America, it flows. It has no other way. It has to flow. It goes through the cables. It goes through the stations that transmit energy. So that is the basic way it works. Now, transmission of energy is essential. We allow the generators of renewables to produce, and we convey the charges from those clean producers. Now, here in ESA, we are the major transporter of energy in Latin America. We belong to CEPAC to the DPR, the CEPAC Energy, and we are in Brazil, we're in Santiago, Chile. We have important presences in those countries, also in the other countries that you listed. Now, in ESA, what do we think of the role of transmission in the energy transmission? Basically, we need more grids. The world is going to need more grids. It said that the world between now and 2050 is going to have to double or triple the size of grids because the world is becoming more and more electric. That is clear. And it's not only a matter of more grids, but we have to use the, the existing grids well. We have to support their modernization. So we have the need to grow and to modernize, and this requires major investment. We in ESA have a plan between now and 2040, and we will be investing $30 billion in Latin America so as to play our role with energy transmission and thus produce the energy transition. So transition is based on transmission, but we can have delays in building the projects. So the equation is turned around. Used to hydraulic plants took 30 years to build, and once the grid, and building a grid can take two to three years to build it. Now the generation being built can be built in two or three years, whereas it takes up to eight years to build a grid. So there is a complete uh, separation between the speed with which renewable energy can be set up and the speed with which projects can be implemented. And it's not a problem just in Latin America. It's a problem worldwide. In the United States and Europe, a project can take 10 to 12 years to implement. Now, what is the good news? The good news is that the main causes for delay in projects are in the hands of all of us here. This is something that can be expressed in one word, and that is we have to solve this problem together. Together is the word. Together is who? It is governments, 
private banks and multilateral banks. The Inter-American Development Bank has usually been a strong partner of ESA, trying to strengthen energy throughout the region. And we hope to work with the IDB even more closely. Now, you asked about the three elements for the energy transition. First of all, we have to improve planning. Second, we have to reduce permitting time. And third, we have to improve regulations. Now, what do I mean when I say improve planning? Well, it's obvious. If projects are taking eight years to build, we have to begin planning early on, but it has to take less time. And that is a challenge for planning. So we have to begin to plan earlier on. We have to be more nimble, but also we have to begin with a plan that is more comprehensive. And planning of energy systems has to look at the social environmental um, viability of projects. We cannot just come in and say to a community, you have to leave because we're going to be setting up some uh, towers. That has to be taken into account, not just by the state, but we in the private sector have to play an important role there too. So improving planning also has to include some important signals in terms of the use of new technologies. Energy storage, for example, not just uh, energy that has always existed, but now it the systems can handle large volumes of energy. So we have to see what can be done in the short term to solve grid problems. In Brazil, we implemented a rationing system, 30 and 60 megawatts per hour, to solve an important grid problem on Brazil's coast. And we did that in one year, and we solved an important grid problem. So we need to do planning regulatory signals so as to apply new technologies. Let me explain that. That's very important and it's important for us. Could you briefly explain what type of incentive exists for the regulatory authorities in Brazil that provided for that level of investment so that we can see the example of a country and see what has to be done so as to be able to take advantage of this technology. Well, Brazil was quite sophisticated, but basically I think that what we did was build trust. And that's important. We generated trust between the private party and the operator. The operator, the OMS in Brazil, is the operator, and they have a lot of power, and they kindly heard us out, were private, and we found a solution to the power um, power outs that were occurring in the dry season along the coast of Brazil. And we proposed something that was not part of the normal framework. And the operator, the OMS, said, okay, let's do this as a pilot. So something that has to be dealt with is the need to build trust. We have to dynamically, flexibly build solutions. We cannot continue to plan as we have so far using criteria that are very, very safe, but that aren't flexible. So we have to look at power electronics, other things that will be mentioned here. That has to be and integrated through this type of conversation so as to assure the their involvement in the regulation. So the rationing system was set up in one year and it solved the grid problem. Now, we talked already about planning. Second, we talked about the time to implement projects especially social, environmental, and land consideration. That takes one half of the time for a project. In other words, four years out of the eight-year span to implement a project, that is what is required to get land permits and to address social and environmental concerns. That doesn't mean that environmental management is not important. We definitely think it is, but 
what we have to do is work with authorities, work with corporations, and with support to multilateral banks to make certain that permitting time by using digitization and different technical techniques, we will be able to cut back on the time required. And then another aspect that we think is essential is changing regulations. Regulations that would provide for using existing infrastructure and also transmission facilities already in place. That can be used using certain technologies, methodologies for ease of implementation. Regulations that would put new technologies into place that would also make good use of energy, as Marcia just said, and regulations that would promote more flexible investment, even having some additional types of risk, calculated risk, but that allow us to be more flexible in doing the transmission. We think that by working together, the state, the private companies, and multilateral banks, and especially working with the IDB, we're convinced that with that, we can set up a working plan that will allow us to accomplish our objectives. Thank you. Thank you. So those are key words, working together. I am going to use them frequently during this meeting. Aurelio, I am going to move my chair so I can see you better. I don't know if you can see me. Okay. So, Aurelio. Sector about electricity. Um, I know that Enel has important investments in distribution, and maybe you can give us a sense of the distribution challenges as they relate to the energy transition. Um, but maybe you could also, because Enel has um, important investments in. Uh, already in early stages of green hydrogen, looking at the industrial uses of energy um, and in e-mobility as well. Really, Marcia just started to touch on e-mobility. And I could see you listening to her and thinking, ooh, maybe Enel could solve that issue of the number of, uh, the number of, of, uh, of, uh, of cars that are being purchased that require, um, that require um, availability for charging. So I'm going to ask you if you could please give us a little bit of background on what Enel is doing in this area on, on, the, on the distribution investments, but also on where you see us going uh, in, terms of, in the region, in terms of green hydrogen investment, um, and in terms of e-mobility, if you'd be so kind. Gracias. Gracias, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've described it very well. In recent years, we have increased our client base. As regards distribution, we have 25 million, and uh, we have connection points, uh, and there's more capillarity, and with over 20 gig generation in the region, over two-thirds of that is already renewable, so it makes perfect sense. And as we saw in Alejandra's graphs, uh, the space for electrification is huge. And uh, of course, the advantage is reductions in pollution. And of course, if you electrify, you uh, reduce losses, there's more energy efficiency. This is why we're into this business and other initiatives such as on hydrogen, which are not yet fully a reality in our region, but we are working. And the people in Latin America live in large cities, so improving street and public lighting is very important and also reduces violence. Going back to electric mobility, we think that can be a fundamental instrument by leveraging the energy transition and electrification. We can leave a, an inheritance for 
future generations in terms of reductions in inequality, promoting other positive things like uh, local entrepreneurship. Our region has a mix that is complementary, complementary relative to the global mix. And uh, we need to also take advantage of mass electrification. Electric buses, for example, is an area in which we're very strong. And this improves the quality of cities. We had a large program in Santiago, one in Bogota, and now there's an important drive in Sao Paulo. We need to do more. We would love to see others do more. And we think that the role of the uh, grid or the network is important. Well, everything is important. The transmission, distribution, and the downstream side of energy cities, the uses of energy. And in line with electromobility, one major game changer is that people want to produce their own energy distributed generation, which is uh, increasing quite considerably in Brazil. So much so that the idea is that one quarter of the sourcing will be through um, this method. And the smart meter is an enabler for this. We see our great challenge as a distributor, that how, how to operate a grid that has a lot of different technological um, sources and uh, technologies, and of course with energy being consumed in increasingly different ways because electromobility still exhibits a major gap in terms of charging infrastructure. I don't think there's just one single solution, but I do think there is complementarity. And we need to do things and do them together, as Gabriel said, because believing that one of us can do it all? No, it isn't that way. We need to leave a legacy in terms of adding value and value for local entrepreneurship through education, among other things. We heard Ilan speak this morning about the importance of energy transition, and we also had a panel on the importance of education. And this energy transition uh, is a major vehicle. I think we're at a unique point in time in Latin America. We should take advantage of that. And the geopolitical configuration places us in a privileged position. And also, Alejandra highlighted this. We have all of the commodities here, so we can definitely take advantage of that. So that's more or less my vision to get a sense of cautious but technical optimism from the panel. We have four and a half minutes left, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to summarize this. I'm going to summarize in two minutes or less. If you have any meetings with your partners in the uh, IDB, they owe you three minutes. Is that when the regulators and the market operators are asked about what is needed, we hear about investment, technology transfer from the private sector, technical solutions for storage, for grid efficiency, for alternatives that are renewable. We also hear about long-term concessionary financing. We talk about we hear about much which needs to come from the private sector. And when we ask the investors what is needed, upstream to downstream, we hear about knowledge and education of the consumers, about planning, about execution of the projects and permitting. And we hear about regulatory incentives and regulatory choices. So it's not rhetoric, 
that we are saying we need to do this all together, it sounds like the kind of things that are just said and sound pretty. This is together. The incentives that come from regulation, that come from pricing, that address generation transmission um, and consumption, as Aurelio was saying, also think ahead, as Marcia was doing, to the other forms of consumption of energy from the beginning. So she talked about congestion tolling. How are we going to get people to charge at, at the non-congested parts of the day, periods of the day, already thinking about flattening the curve, like transmission flattens the curve when we have interconnection, like the, the, the Guatemalan demand and the need for generation to supply the market is flattened when you interconnect with Mexico and with Central America along the margins. This is what we mean by we need to do it together. It's the regu regulation, the consumers, the incentives, and it's the technology, the financing, um, and the long-term financing, concessional or affordable, um, as much as it can be, because it, it flows through to our consumers. In the yep. end of the day, that is why we are here um, for the consumers. Um, so that is the trans I think that is the story of energy transition. This is an amazing panel for me, the best that I have, I've listened to. I've learned a lot talking with you these last few days. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the IBB, on behalf of our clients, and I give you back your two minutes. Please spend it wisely. That is my advice to you. <laughs> thank you. Good. Muchísimas gracias a los panelistas. Un fuerte Thank you very much and a big hand once again. We have come to the final session of today's seminars. These have been enriching interventions that address a whole lot of topics, but there are still a lot more coming. See you tomorrow at 9 o'clock on the dot. We look forward to seeing you for sharing more knowledge. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of the day. En marzo, la República Dominicana será el escenario de debates y decisiones económicas y financieras para el desarrollo de América Latina y el Caribe. Con la celebración de las reuniones de las Asambleas de Gobernadores del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, BID, y del BID Invest. Un país alegre, de gente que cada día se esfuerza y contribuye a mantener un aparato productivo y una economía en crecimiento, recibirá a los 48 países miembros del BID, a líderes empresariales y de la sociedad civil de la región. En Punta Cana, del 6 al 10 de marzo, continuaremos avanzando hacia el progreso y el bienestar, construyendo un futuro donde la cooperación y el compromiso sean la base de un desarrollo sostenible para todos. Juntos, sigamos haciendo.